In November of 1942, the British had defeated the Nazis in North Africa in the Second Battle of El Alamein. Winston Churchill, shortly after that, delivered a speech in which he famously said, Now, this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end. But it is, perhaps, the end of of the beginning. I think that's exactly where we find ourselves in Solomon's life as we come to 1 Kings chapter 9. It's not the end and it's not even the beginning of the end but it is certainly the end of the beginning and I hope that you'll understand a little more what I mean by that as we read this passage together. We come to 1 Kings chapter 9, I think that it's a good description, uh, understanding what has occurred and unfolded in the first 20 years or so of Solomon's reign as king of Israel. Of course, he came after his father, David, and there was a little drama in relation to uh, who would take the throne after David. Of course, Solomon ascends the throne and makes short work of any who would stand in the way of his reign, having been placed there, ordained by God to be the king. And at the point that we arrive in 1 Kings 9, the temple has been completed. It has been dedicated in an elaborate worship and prayer service in chapter 8 that we've looked at over the last couple of weeks. Twenty years have passed in Solomon's reign. He has accomplished unity in Israel that it will be unparalleled at any point in the future of Israel. Um, he has undertaken a massive building and expansion program, including his own palace. And in chapter 9, God appears to him for a second time. He is quite literally... Uh, reigning over a superpower of his day. He has the respect of those in Egypt and those to the east. He uh, reigns over a massive landmass, the largest territorial boundaries that Israel uh, had ever had, uh, even during the time of David, much more in the time of Solomon, uh, and more than they ever would have, as after Solomon there's a period of decline. Now, the first time God appeared to Solomon, it marked the beginning of his uh, unprecedented rise to power through wisdom. That's what's interesting about Solomon. As the wisest man in the world, he did not rise to power through political manipulation. He did not rise to power through uh, financial savvy. He did not rise to power through military conquest. Although his rise included all of those elements, they grew out of his wisdom. And so we know from what Solomon himself writes in the book of Proverbs, and we read time and time again in Scripture, that it is the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. And so from the very beginning, God appears to Solomon. Solomon wisely, in a godly way, asks for wisdom. He's granted the ability to have anything he wants. He can have riches, he can have power, he can have prestige. He asks for wisdom, which is in itself a wise request. God grants him wisdom. He says, not only that, but you're going to have so much more because of that wisdom. And that was his first Appearance, God's first appearance to Solomon, and things went really well from that point. I mean, we've hit a high point in the construction of the temple and the dedication of the temple and the presence of the Lord actually filling the temple. What a sight to have seen. Amazing that the presence of the Lord literally physically manifests itself in the presence of the people. A theophany, the Appearance of God in a form that is recognizable to man. Now in chapter 9 that we're about to read together, we read of a second appearance by God to Solomon. So if the first appearance of God to Solomon marked the beginning of his meteoric rise in power, then the second appearance 
of God to Solomon is going to mark the beginning of the end of Solomon. Actually, a marker that marks the end of the high water mark and the beginning of the decline, the beginning of the, the fall of Solomon and his kingdom. Follow with me as we begin reading in verse 1. As soon as Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that Solomon desired to build, the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your plea which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you... If you will walk before me as David your father walked with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. As I promised David your father, saying you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. But if you turn aside from following me, you or your children, do not keep my commandments and my statutes that I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them. Then I will cut off Israel from the land that I have given them, and the house that I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight, and Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all peoples. And this house will become a heap of ruins, and everyone passing by it will be astonished and will hiss, and they will say, why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? And they will say, because they abandoned the Lord, their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them, and therefore the Lord has brought all this disaster on them. At the end of 20 years in which Solomon had built the two houses, the house of the Lord and the king's house, and Hiram king of Tyre had supplied Solomon with cedar and cypress timber and gold as much as he desired, King Solomon gave to Hiram 20 cities in the land of Galilee. But when Hiram came from Tyre to see the cities that Solomon had given him, they did not please him. Therefore... He said, what kind of cities are these that you've given me, my brother? So they are called the land of Kabul to this day. Kabul means uh, barren or uh, useless, worthless. Hiram had sent to the king 120 talents of gold. And this is the account of the forced labor that King Solomon drafted to build the house of the Lord in his own house and the Milo and the wall of Jeru Jerusalem and Hazor and Megiddo and Gezer. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up and captured Gezer and burned it with fire and had killed the Canaanites who lived in the city and had given it as dowry to his daughter, Solomon's wife. So Solomon rebuilt Gezer and lower Beth Horon and Balath and Tamar in the wilderness in the land of Judah. And all the store cities that Solomon had and the cities for his chariots and the cities for his horsemen and whatever Solomon desired to build in Jerusalem, in Lebanon, and in all the land of his dominion. And all the people who were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, who were not of the people of Israel, their descendants who were left after them in the land, whom the people of Israel were unable to devote to destruction, these Solomon drafted to be slaves. And so they are to this day. But of the people of Solomon, of Israel, Solomon were his officials, his commanders, his captains, his chariot commanders, and his horsemen. These were the chief officers who were over Solomon's work, 550 who had charge of the people who carried on the work. But Pharaoh's daughter went up from the city of David to her own house that Solomon had built for her, and then he built the Milo. Three times a year, Solomon used to offer up burnt offerings and peace offerings on the altar he built to the Lord, making offerings with it before the Lord, so he finished the house. King Solomon built a fleet of ships, it is Zion Geber, which is near Eloth on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. And Hiram sent with the fleet his servants, seamen who were familiar with the sea, 
together with the servants of Solomon. And they went to Ophir and brought from their gold 420 talents. And they brought it to King Solomon. So chapter 9 has two major sections. There's 1 through 9, and then there's 10 through 28. And the division is quite clear, quite easy to discern. The first nine verses are God's response to Solomon's building of the temple. And his response to his prayer of dedication, God answers back all that Solomon prays. Remember that lengthy prayer that we looked at last time in chapter 8. But then verses 10 through 28 record and recount, summarize some of the tainted blessings that Solomon enjoyed. I want to be careful to put the emphasis on the fact that these blessings are tainted blessings, just subtly so. They're blessings. They're the kinds of things that you look at and you say, wow, isn't God doing great things? But then when you look a little deeper, you begin to say, maybe what we thought were blessings were actually curses. Wonder if that may not be a bit of the case in modern American culture where we are so rich and so satisfied and so often complacent and lazy in our spiritual lives, lazy in our discipleship efforts, lazy in our relationships to one another, sometimes literally lazy. And we look around and we say, how much God has blessed. We have so much. And what we might initially view as a blessing might actually be a curse. I think that's certainly what we see unfolding in Solomon's life. But overall in these 28 verses, we're reminded of this simple truth of Scripture. Here's the, the core of, of what I want to communicate to you from this word. It's not how you start the race, it's how you finish the race. And whether or not you finish strong is totally dependent upon the power of Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. To not be complacent. To not see material blessings as immediate proof of God's favor on our lives will help us finish strong. Paul tells Timothy near the end of his life, he says, I finished the race. That's his analogy of what he looks, what he feels like his life looks like. It's been a race. And he's, he's run the race. He's fought the good fight with endurance. I wonder if at the end of this study in a week or so, if we'll be able to say that Solomon fought the good fight and finished the race strong. So here's, really I want to focus on the first nine and then we'll look at the last verses together. So if you look at verse nine, or the, or the first nine verses of chapter nine, here, here's the application that I want to go back and kind of unfold from the text. So, so if you're taking notes, this is, this is something that you would write down. Following Christ is a day-by-day, moment-by-moment obedience, not merely a one-time past event. Following Christ is a day-by-day, moment-by-moment Dying to self, surrender to self, killing of sin, loving of God, ongoing obedience. Not merely something that we look back at as one time in time and space event that somehow has ongoing um, 
um, factors and, and, and ripple effects that kind of carry us, kind of bring us along, kind of a wave that we just ride, coast. No way we might say it is that way. The Christian life is not something we can coast through. So some people look at the Christian life very much we're in graduation season, fresh on the beginning of the summer, kids to school's out, people have graduated from high school, graduated from uh, college, whatever the situation is. Well, that's something you do one time and that's it, right? So when you sit before an employer, they say, have you graduated? Yes. Have you finished high school? Yes. It's done. It's in the past. It's not something you do over and over again. Some people look at following Christ, Christianity, being saved, whatever you want to call it, in the same way. Are you saved? Yes! It's what I did at some point back there. Yes, that's part of it, but it's so much more than that. And we get the sense of this in verses 1 through 9 of chapter 9. I mean, think about Solomon. If anybody had a glowing resume of faithfulness to God, it was Solomon. I mean, you don't get much better than the title, wisest man on earth, right? That's pretty good. I mean, if you read his resume, he's written hundreds of proverbs. He's reigned over Israel at the height of Israel's political greatness. I mean, after all, did you catch the fact that the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, is giving money as a dowry for his wife? Think about the significance of that. In feudalistic systems, medieval times, Middle Ages, you know how that worked with kings and queens and princes and princesses. Marriages were equivalent to alliances. And if you're a father, if you're a king of a nation, you want your daughters to marry into powerful families of other kingdoms. So think about what it says about Israel's position of power that Pharaoh gives his daughter to Solomon as a wife. That's trading up, right? He does. Pharaoh doesn't give his daughter in marriage to the king of the Amorites. But he gives his daughter in marriage to the king of Israel. Think how far they've come since they were slaves in Egypt. I mean, so many things. I mean, look, verses 10 and following that we'll look at more deeply in just a moment are just a, a, a recounting, a summary of all of these great accomplishments. And so God appears in chapter 9 to Solomon a second time, having heard, he said, I heard and I honored your prayer. I heard the prayer, Solomon. It was a good prayer. And I will honor it by consecrating this house. He says, I have, I have uh, sanctified the temple. I've put my name on the temple. When we began a time of worship together, often we invoke the Lord, right? Come, Lord, be with us, present. And, of course, we know God is everywhere, right? So what do we mean when we say that? What we mean is, God, be present with us in a special sense in which you're present to bless us, to be actively involved. And that's what Solomon prays, and God answers and said, I heard you, and I'm here. That's pretty amazing. And so he heard, he honored Solomon's beautiful, God-glorifying prayer of dedication for the temple. 
And then God reminds Solomon of his promise to dwell with the people. He says, I will place my name on the temple. Listen to it again, verse 3. I have heard your prayer and your plea which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built by putting my name there forever. Look at the next sentence. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. That sounds pretty unconditional. That's what we want to hear from our children or what children want to hear from their parents or what one spouse wants to hear from the other. I will love you forever. There's nothing you can do to make me stop loving you. That's what God said to us in Christ. It's a, not a bad definition of grace. Grace is, in one sense, the idea that for, for, for those who are the recipients of God's grace, there's nothing you can do to make God love you more, and there's nothing you can do to make God love you less. He loves you with a perfect and unconditional love. There's an unconditional aspect to the promises of God that he makes to his people in covenant. He's made covenant with Abraham. He's made covenant with Moses. He's made covenant with David. And when we say he enters into a covenant, what that means is he cannot break his promise. He cannot deny his own word. When he makes the covenant with Abraham, of course you remember the animal pieces are halved and the smoking pot moves through the pieces. And a covenant, covenant means to cut. Okay, that's where the word comes from. And the idea of making a covenant with someone is the idea that if I break covenant with you, may happen to me what has happened to these pieces. May I literally be cut. And that's pretty serious. And I think, just as a sidebar, just very briefly, it's not a bad image to impress upon young men and women who are seeking to marry one another. The nature of covenant. This is not a contract. This is a covenant. Maybe we ought to have them walk through a goat cut in half. I don't know. To make the point. Branded on their minds. But the bulk of the verses change after that point. So he says, for all time. And then look at verse 4. The first phrase is key. And as for you, if, if you walk before me, as your, day, day, as your father David walked, with integrity of heart, uprightness, doing, to all that, uh, doing according to all I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, then... So you have an if-then statement. That's a conditional statement. If you do this, then I will do this. That's not an unconditional covenant statement. That's a conditional promise. If you keep my statutes, Solomon, then I will establish your royal throne. Then in verse 6, there's another conditional statement. But if you turn aside from following me, you or your children, do not keep my commandments or my statutes that I, have, that I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and the house that I have consecrated for my name. I will cast out of my sight and Israel will become a proverb and a byword among all peoples. Two if-then conditional statements. So, the bulk of the verses are about Solomon's conditional obedience to ensure that God would continue to dwell and bless the people, dwell among the people, bless the people, dwell in the temple, give Israel prosperity. But if Solomon turns from God, there would be major consequences not only for Solomon, but for the kingdom and the people as a whole. And, and the lesson for us is this. Sometimes we so emphasize the unconditional grace of God in salvation that we might be inclined to not remember that we are responsible for following Christ daily. 
take up your cross daily. We make choices daily. And choices are real. Choices matter in life. We are responsible and God is sovereign. God's absolute sovereignty in all things does not in any way negate our responsibility before that sovereign God. Philip Ryken is, has a helpful word on this. So I want to just quote him for a moment. Solomon, he's talking about Solomon here obviously. Solomon still had to choose. If he continued to walk with God, if he led his family in the worship of God, if he ruled with righteousness, if he practiced personal holiness, then he would receive all the blessings that God has promised for obedience. But if he turned away from God and started heading down the road to idolatry, he would fall under judgment. And you and I, as born-again believers, face the same choice every day, the choice of daily obedience to the Lord. Daily dying to sin and self. And this might ruffle our feathers and step on our toes, but I'm preaching this as much as to you as to me, that what we did for God yesterday does not meet the demand He places on us today. There's no rollover minutes in God's plan. Well, I did a lot of stuff last year for God. And it's not even really a healthy way to look at it in terms of doing something for God. The simple fact of the matter is, no matter how well we began the Christian life, no matter how faithfully we answered God's call to surface, no matter how... Um, strongly we turn to God in prayer, no matter how many tears were shed, no matter how intense the emotion was, no matter what we've accomplished in ministry, no matter how big our churches are, how big the budgets are, or how big our homes are, any of those other factors, the choice is still there today, every day, and every day for the rest of our lives. Follow Christ and that in no way, hear me very carefully, that in no way negates or denies the absolute sovereignty of God. It in no way denies whatsoever the doctrine of divine election, not in the least. Of course it doesn't. Our choice of God or our choice for God is based on the choice that he made for us from the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1, 3 through 12. And once we truly come to Christ, we're never going to lose our salvation. So don't understand what I'm saying to mean choose for Christ today, don't choose for Christ tomorrow. That means you're going to hell. You lost something that you previously had. That's not the case either. But it does mean that even secure in Christ and in God's sovereignty, we still must work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. Philippians chapter 2. Just go there briefly. I want you to put your eyes on this and see it. It is the principle of 1 Kings 9, I believe, worked out in the New Testament. So I want to go to Philippians 2, verse 12. Verse 12 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, o obedience, obeying, what's another word for that? He says it. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So it's all about what you do. No, because look at the next verse. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Not only that, in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, Peter tells us, or those that he's writing to, by extension all of us, to make your calling and election sure. To nail it down, to question yourself. 
It's my life demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit. I hope that you take seriously the need that we have to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. You know the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. Verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. If, if you are void of love, like Paul says, you're just a banging gong. You're nothing in terms of fruit, of conversion, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. I want to see those things in my life every day. That is making my calling and election sure. It's not making myself saved. It's demonstrating the evidence that I am saved. The way we glorify God is by following Him today, not trusting merely in something we did yesterday. There is no place for coasting in the Christian life. Because, listen friends, spiritual drift is real and it is deadly dangerous. Your salvation is not based on your works. You can't say, God will save me if I have love and if I have joy and if I have patience and if I have gentleness and if I have self-control. No. You will only have joy, love, patience, gentleness, self-control if in fact God has saved you. You can't, you, can't get it, you can't get the cart before the horse and make it wrong. So pay close attention to your life, to your holiness. Drift happens in tiny steps, as we'll see as we close here. But make no mistake, it's not you. It is Christ within you. Let me show you where that is. Uh, one of my favorite verses that illustrates that truth. Uh, I've shared it with you on other occasions. Go to Jude. Last book before Revelation, Jude. So the last part of Jude is a call to persevere. Verse 17. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ... They said to you in the, last day, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Listen to what he says in verse 21. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire to show others, uh, to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now, that is totally a, uh, an imperative sentence. He's saying, you do this, right? But then look at verse 24. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. See what he did? He said to do these things, to be holy. But who's the one who's going to make you holy? Who's the one that's going to hold you in that holiness? Jesus. That's what he says in verse 24. We sang it a moment ago. He will hold me fast. In my own power, I will drift, I will fail, I will fall, I will slide into idolatry. And that's what happened to Solomon. 
That's what I want to look at as we close. Back in 1 Kings 9, once again. So the first truth, really what I've been talking about this entire time is the fact that following Christ is a moment by moment, day by day obedience. It's not just a one-time event. I walked an aisle, I signed a card, I got dipped in the water. It's not just that. Now here's what the last verses, I think, really emphasize. Simple self-reliance as opposed to reliance on Christ, being, being dependent on yourself, not on Christ, can lead directly to spiritual idolatry. Trusting in yourself more than you're trusting in Christ can lead to spiritual idolatry. It didn't, over, it didn't happen overnight for Solomon, did it? This is a 20-year summary in the second half of chapter 9. And, and what you see, the author of 1 Kings shows us, is just tiny cracks in Solomon's armor developing. From the wisest man in the world who says, cut the baby in half. No! And he's, everybody says, wow, what wisdom! Now you just see some little flaws beginning to come out. It's very uh, subtle. So small evidences of a lack of wisdom, which is a shame given he's the wisest man. He schemes against Hiram. Remember, the, he made a deal with Hiram way back when the temple was going to be built. And what does he do? He gives him some trash cities. He, 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 he doesn't... It's not bad. I mean, you know, ten cities, I guess, is better than no cities to be given. But it's just a little less than integrity. Did you catch that? It's just, it's just a little less than what is noble. And hey, here, uh, Hiram can't really do anything about it. So he, he, he schemes a little bit. He begins, you can see, in, a, in just reading this, verse 28, Solomon built a fleet of ships. Just very subtly begins to trust in his military might more than the fear of the Lord. He just starts to dabble a little bit with allowing too much foreign influence. He takes an Egyptian wife. Now nothing explicitly in the text says this was a horrible thing. Solomon should not have done this. But you just start to see these little tiny cracks in the armor coming up. He starts making some very dangerous decisions. Oh, he's still going to the temple. He's still offering burnt offerings and peace offerings at the altar he built to the Lord. But notice what God required. He says in verse 4, As for you, if you walk before me as David your father with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing all that I have commanded, then I will establish your throne forever. Listen, external things don't impress God. The sacrifices that God desires is that of a broken heart, a contrite spirit. Humility before the Lord. And as I already said, it's interesting that none of these things in and of themselves get a, a, a rebuke from God, at least not that's recorded, of course. He continues to worship God externally. He does things that look righteous, may even look wise on the surface, but he's just very gradually starting to trust in things and in people that will eventually lead him into idolatry. And so the, the moral of the story, if you will, and we'll see it most fully next week as we move into, uh, we're most likely going to summarize 10 and we'll conclude the series uh, in 11. We're going to see what starts out subtle becomes full-blown idolatry. And the moral of the story is simply this. 
Solomon had such a strong start. But spiritual drift began. And eventually he finds himself living in rebellion and total idolatry. So what's the conclusion we should draw from all this? We should try harder, right? No. Do not leave this place thinking that the call of Scripture on your life this morning is you need to do a better job following Jesus. No. No. The moral of this text, the lesson of the text is leave this place dying to self and saying, Lord, I cannot do it without you. But would you so fill my life with your spirit that my life would overflow with evidences and the fruit of the spirit such that I would constantly trust in you and never trust in my own ability or my circumstances or my resources or anything else. The answer is not do more good works. The answer is simple. The gospel. Trust in Christ. Die to self. Christ always chose the right way. He never veered. He never drifted. Solomon drifted. Jesus was on course every moment of every day of his life. Your security is not in your ability to keep yourself clean and pure. It is in the finished work of Christ. He will hold you fast. Would you stand with me as we close our time? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you above all for the gospel. We thank you that your covenant with us in Christ is unconditional. But Lord, help us to strive to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling. Because the fear of you, O oh Lord, is the beginning of wisdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.